この番組はご覧のスポンサーの提供でお送りしますオーライディ、ウェルカムエブリワン、アイムティアブー、アンアイアムヒア。That's about all I got. Woo! We made it back. It has been a little while since I've been recording anywhere near consistently. And today, I think, is the first day of getting back into that as a groove. So, welcome back.、Um, pleased to be here, very much so. Thanks for your patience or freaking the fuck out and uh, uh, making lots and lots of comments on the internet, <laughs> calling, me, calling me like all sorts of weird things because I, I'm not making videos.、Um, I don't want to hash too much of that out, except the parts that I feel like are relevant to ReZero in a significant way. And I'm not sure how, the, the, how they're relevant yet. So I'm going to hit this from a couple of angles all at once. Because I'm not sure how this is all going to click together. And what we're kind of talking about is going to be things clicking together, kind of the opposite of things falling apart. Although that's part of things too. I don't think we need to worry too much about how things fall apart. Like, they do that just fine on their own. But how things, how do I, can I do this better? How things come back together is far more interesting, I think.、Um, and how we, how we work toward that in our own lives, how we struggle and stumble and fall and come back, is a piece of the storytelling that's incorporated into ReZero, I think, in a really effective way. And there are pieces of it that have been very useful for me over the past little bit of time. And there are pieces of, My existence that make me understand ReZero a little bit better. But I'm not sure how they all click together yet. And again, what we're kind of talking about is things clicking together. And you might notice this drawing that I've got is already done, and that's a little weird. I am going to scribble at it because just the act of doing so helps get my mind right. But the drawing's already done, and that's because I drew this last night. I did it last night because I wanted it to be the last thing that I did. And then the first thing that I looked at when I woke up, I wanted to focus on it because this drawing would be, no matter what, the thing that I ended up talking about here in the morning for ReZero because I set that as a, a goal state for myself, something that I had to do and want to do and need to do. But how did I get there and how do we get there? I, I, I don't know. It's like for a long time, and this drawing started here in the corner and moved this way. I thought at first it would be gears that are like broken and not coming together. But then as I drew, I realized that it was more like, like a drivetrain or something. And it's building toward this thing, which I'm not sure exactly how to draw, but it's, it's a drill. And I've for a long time seen myself and life in that form because of Gurren Lagan. Seeing yourself as a drill, a, a thing that iterates, that moves forward step by step, that. Changes and grows with every turn, but comes back around. And there are all sorts of interesting oscillatory patterns that you get out of drills that have waveforms that make a lot of sense to me. And there's a lot of meaning you can get from it. But there's a piece that's missing from that set of analogies. In Gurren Lagan, the drill just goes. You just will it to, and then it goes. It's kind of the idea is that that spiral energy is like human life force. It just goes. And the mecha is the machinery around the person, the stuff that actually applies the force, that becomes the drill, that does the thing. All it needs is for that expression of intent to hit it, and then it goes. But what it ignores is that those things are just, they're animated. They're not like reality. And reality requires some machinery. It requires some gears, some bits and pieces to be working. There have to be some in between parts between desire to do a thing and actually doing a thing. There have to be some systems in place. There have to be some modes of being and some methods and some structures in order for things to mesh. Because you could be, and I have been for a while, I've been this gear spinning. While my drill apparatus is sitting over here, and this centerpiece has been like cracked or broken or like out of alignment or something. Some piece of the drivetrain is what feels like it's missing. I don't feel like I've been missing motivation, and I don't feel like I'm like, like I don't have access to the drill. It feels like there's something in between that was stuck or cracked. And that all those pieces had to come together in order for it to like express properly into the world. 
I don't know if all the pieces are coming together, but I think I'm at a point where enough pieces are unbroken enough that sitting down here is putting the pieces back together. Is that weird? Does that make sense? I don't know if it makes sense, but let me try to apply it to ReZero in a way. There are lessons that Subaru can't learn until he learns them. There are things that can't, like, that can't be overcome until the moment when everything fits and they can be understood completely and overcome. There are times when we want to look at Subaru and, like, shake him and be like, you could have figured that out five loops ago, and all of this pain that you've gone through, you wouldn't have gone through. Why didn't you just be nicer then? Like, why did you, did you spend so much time? Why, why couldn't you just be a better partner? Like, why couldn't you just figure the thing out? Like, why, why, why? But it takes time and it takes iteration and it takes failure and it takes failed attempts and it takes stumbling. And on different show paths, it takes fucking laying in bed for a while. Sometimes I miss watching Mushoku because there are periods where Rudy is just me and he just needs to lay in bed for a while. And that's how part of what I've been. But I've also been doing things. And that's something that's hard to express or explain or share. I, like Subaru, have had internal and personal struggles throughout my life with executive dysfunction and self-control impulse disorders, um, just doing stuff, uh, getting myself to do things, very difficult for me, especially when they're structured, especially when they're scheduled, especially when there's any sort of like expectation that I'm going to do them, especially when there's somebody waiting for them, especially when there's somebody asking for them. Fuck. Horrifying. Uh, pathological demand avoidance. My partner nailed that one. I've had a lot of trouble just existing. And now I'm taking on some responsibilities in interacting with another person who also has trouble just existing. That's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot. I, I don't know how to express that it's a lot. Um, and that I think it's fair that it's a lot and that it makes sense. But I spent much of last week out of town in my partner's hometown. I went and I visited them in their space where their pain is, where their trauma is. And for most of the time that I was there, it was work because their space is unsafe. Like the house is physically falling apart and I have the power and the capacity to do things about it. And so I had to. So I spent this past weekend putting in a floor in a bathroom so that there wasn't exposed like underlayment and fixing a toilet so that it flushed and didn't leak. And oh my God, organizing so much shit in a room that was so like over piled with stuff and just a complete overwhelm. And it took days and days, but I got it to a place where I think a person can live in that space a little bit. And that work in the physical world mirrors work in the emotional world that has been part of the structuring and restructuring of the two people that are myself and my partner as we engage in this relationship that we're, that we're pursuing. And like Subaru, it's like death after death for me. Not deaths, but little deaths. Like little get crushed and have to rebuild. Get to discover that you're not enough. That's what it's been over and over and over and over is discovering that I'm not big enough. I'm not strong enough. I don't have enough to me. I don't have the like the spoons. I don't have the the fuel, the energy. And most importantly, that if I want in the future to be capable of doing anything at all and not regressing significantly, if I want to have this thing go well, this work thing where I make and create, if I want to have my relationship go well, if I want to have my internal life go well and my physical like body do well, that I need to rebuild my structures. 
that I need to rebuild my engine, that the gear has got to change. Pieces have to be reboard. I need more power. And I need more stability and resilience in order to handle that power. Just like you bump the horsepower or compression forces on an engine up and you need to replace all those parts because they're not going to handle that, those stresses. And engines go out, of, go out of work when they're being rebuilt and replaced. I've been out of work for a little while. Been out of, out of commission. And it's not been a passive time. It has been an active time of rebuilding. And when you're rebuilding yourself, that means tearing chunks out of yourself. Evaluating them. Putting pieces of them back in and replacing other pieces with other parts. For a long time, I felt desperately unable to stop. Right? Like you're in a car and it's running and the engine's falling apart, but you got to get to where you're going. And if you stop, you die. Kind of can't stop. But it's needed at some time in the shop. I've needed some time in the shop and some maintenance. And during that time, what I've been doing is I've been restructuring and rebuilding, stacking out my habits figuring out how I want my space and my room structured, making little changes and experiments and seeing if they, in this weird time of experimentation, collapse everything or make everything more stable. Make the kinds of shifts that I've been unwilling to make. Shifts like just letting myself record later in the day. It's later in the day today. For months, I've struggled to get up early and get going early and get a recording done early, and I've failed like every day. And I only end up recording later. So I've res rescheduled my structure. I'm rec recording later in the day. I'm just going to do earlier stuff earlier. I'm going to eat earlier. Simple things, but things that don't feel like they can be changed when you're under stress. Rebuilding myself. Rebuilding patterns for my partner. Figuring out how we can see each other. And work together. And run at full power. How I can do that? On my own? But also... Oh. That's it. That's the piece of the drawing that's missing. That's the piece of the drawing that's missing, is that this, that's a drill too. It's, um, it's Gallo and Leo, it's, it's, it's two. It's two. It's, it's a pair, it's a partnership, it's linked, it's chained. It's not just that I'm... I'm structuring my engine. It's that I'm restructuring my engine so that it works with two drivetrains, like two drills. It's a full rebuild. It's a full restructuring. No wonder I feel so fucking broken. And realizing that, no wonder I'm starting to feel more whole. Because I've put... I had to step away from my own in order to put some pieces together over here. Because if the pieces... If I'm going to be connected to another person and they're going to be broken, then I'm going to be broken by our connection. So I had to unbreak pieces of them and unbreak pieces of myself so that we could get this thing going. And now, for the first time, ka-chunk, it feels like it's ka-chunk, it's like turning. They've got their work and they're going to their job and they're at their job right now and it's going okay. And I've got mine and, and I'm doing it right now and it's going okay. And, and we can step together into the future because that's what that's what the that's what the drawing was last week was them stepping together was them stepping together into the light right like together as one they finally saw each other they finally connected for real for real and they stepped out into the world in into struggle and pain and harshness and then they took their newfound connectedness 
Amelia and Super, they took their newfound connectedness, their newfound strength, and their ability to lean on each other and the things that they'd learned from each other. The fact that they're now two drills, the fact that they can push harder, the fact that they can hit things from multiple angles. And finally, after many layers of struggling against Garf, just to get through to him as a person, like, to be able to see eye to eye a little bit, finally, finally, because of their connectedness, because of the stability that they've achieved together, they were able to connect with him. And then the engine gets, the whole thing gets more resilient. The whole thing starts moving and working and it's like, it's like almost out of control how much power it has because now Garf is on board and, and all these things are possible. So that's enough to get our first step. And now we hit our first hurdle. Our first stumbling point, we go once around one rotation of the the engine and Amelia's got some internal pieces that still haven't been figured out. She's got a trial to overcome. She's backed up by the stability on the other end. Truly, that is what it is. She's backed up by the stability on the other end and that's where we left her. Walking into this trial and now finding... All of the scratched marks everywhere. Subaru, you dummy, you dummy. But he's there and he's with her and they're structured together. And so now, now that they've connected heavily enough, they can be separated and they're still running in unison. That's it. They're synced. Kind of. I, I know my metaphors are all fucked. I'm sorry. They're synced. They're locked. They're in unison. Even across the time and space boundaries of the trial, Amelia goes into this space and she's able to embody pieces of Subaru and lean on him even though he's not there. She strikes his pose and she says what she says and she is who he sees her as. They reinforce each other. He's able to stand up for himself and they're able to stand up against Garf because they, they're they able to co comprehend and have compassion. That's one of those things where... It would have been so easy to see what Garf was going through and overcome it, but it couldn't be done until it was done. It couldn't be clicked into place until all the other pieces were clicked into place with him and Amelia. The story is structured such that every piece has to lock in as a chunk in order for the whole, uh, whole thing to move. I think I just blew my mind about, about the writing in, in ReZero. Sometimes life is really hard, and it's a struggle to just exist. When you take on a responsibility like sharing your existence with other people, whether that's an individual in a relationship or the public through the internet, I feel like, and this is maybe something that I unfairly place upon myself, but I feel like there's some responsibility inherent in that taken on responsibility to share well and to try to do it to do good and also to try to not share a lot of chaos and destruction and stuff garf as a character isn't well on the inside so he tries to like force his perspective on a bunch of people and um cause a lot of pain and then subaru has to incorporate and comprehend and understand himself and once he does, and only once he does, is he able to reach out and be there for Amelia and be stable for her. And that, I think, is correct. It mirrors my own experience. And I had a lot of stabilizing to do before I could reach out and be there for the person that I'm trying to be there for. And then, having stabilized that and having it work, he's able to step out of there stronger and share his perspective in a strong way in a, in a resilient way, one that's built around friendship and built around compassion for self and like, yeah, compassion for self. And given that compassion for self and the work that he's done, he's able to reach Garf. And he's only able to reach Garf because of the work that he did on himself and on himself and Amelia and on himself and Otto, right? Those pieces all contribute to his capacity to do the next thing and to share what he's learned effectively. I feel like I have that responsibility when I sit in front of this camera to try to comprehend these shows in a way that's more meaningful than just what the text says. I try to live them. 
And sometimes living them, when a show includes characters breaking and falling apart, or characters building and being strong, requires breaking and falling apart, or building and being strong. Sometimes building and being strong is really hard to accomplish. It's kind of the thing about anime that thrills me so much is that it gives roadmaps and like inspiration to do that. It makes me, even when I'm most fallen apart, confident that there are ways to become rebuilt. And it shows me other people and their falling aparts and their rebuildings. It's so potent. But it has always to me been more than media more than shows that i watch like it's it infuses itself into my reality i cannot help but in incorporate and integrate the things that i consume the books the characters the people the stories the the art itself i cannot help but incorporate it and so that takes time and it means rebuilding and breaking over this past little period we watched a chunk of Mushoku Tensei uh, for a show that's like pretty psychologically incorporatable. We watched all of Free Run, a show that might be the most important media piece of media of the last couple decades, and like fundamentally altered my brain chemistry. I know we we use like that thing altered my brain chemistry pretty flippantly now, but like it fucking altered my brain chemistry, and I had to sit down and take a nap for a few days wild trying to live these shows and experience them fully means living like living living and taking on challenges and threats and struggles finding monsters and dragons and fighting them it's a really scary thing to engage with life wholeheartedly to see everything as potentially useful, potentially a part of your experience. To walk through life with this attitude that's like, it's something that I expressed the other, the other day. I probably haven't seen my favorite show yet. Probably haven't read my favorite book yet. Might not have met my favorite person yet. Probably haven't had my favorite day. Or experienced my favorite favorite experience. Or had my best kiss. If you live life like that, like even if you're 80, if you live life like that, it kind of forces you to live every bit of it. Because like, what if it might be the best part of it? So I try to watch shows like that. And to... To hope that there's something of value there. And to look for that. I hope it comes across well. I know this whole intro has been blathery. It's inevitable. It's been like over a week since I've been in front of the camera. So, sorry. Some of it is like brushing off the dust or whatever. As we make this first step and turn again. As we step outside, because to me, I think I'm lagging. I'm a couple episodes behind in terms of incorporating ReZero. Fair, there's a lot going on here. Like, I don't know if I've stepped outside of the the trial space yet, and like with Amelia. I think I'm still stuck in there. I think what I'm doing right now is like the equivalent of the conversation with Garf. Where like I've connected with that person... I feel st solid. I feel like I can move now. From there, in our show, we're now focused on Amelia. What Subaru and Garf get up to out in the outer world is all going to be dependent on how she does in the inner now. So, I think now I've said my piece and expressed what I most needed to express fumblingly. 
Thank you for bearing with me. Or not. If you skip this, that's great. That's great. Nobody needs to listen to my bullshit. It's fine. If you did listen to all my bullshit, thanks for bearing with my bullshit. I love you all very much. It's like pretty amazing to me that there are people who will stick with me while I go through these fluctuations in life. But also, like, man, this is the shit that's necessary for the content to be good. And so I'm going to do the shit that's necessary for the content to be good. And then the content will be good. And it will come out when it comes out. And I hope that that is, that is good. I'd much rather spend the time to be an okay human being and then make good content that doesn't cause harm and chaos and shit and, and make bad things. Because it's important to me. Thanks for joining me. Let's see how Amelia does on her side of the trial. Now that things are locked in, and she's got all this stability and support, she steps in to something she's been unable to face, and it is very, very interesting. Because she's facing someone who looks a lot like herself. And is very mean to her. We're going to watch episode 17 of Re Zero Season Two. I do not have custom subtitles for this episode. That this is one of the episodes that doesn't have doesn't have them, and so we're just going to watch it as it comes at us. Thank you for joining me. I love you. <laughs> Let's watch Re Zero. Ah, I'm back watching anime. Feels so good. Feels so good. God, oh my God, it's 29 minutes long. Episode 17, Season 2, up and ready to go. There will be two versions, picture in picture in the description. Timer on YouTube, BB Timer to count you down. Early access on the Patreon. Just to be clear, early means early. doesn't mean that it comes out on a schedule. It just means that you'll get it a week early from when the YouTube would get it. Just saying that. It's important to say. BB Timer. Yeah. Puck is crying. for all this time. That was us going back in time. Skibbity skibbity scoop. Oh, no. We just shifted over to here. Is she still talking to Echidna? Oh. I think she's really... <laughs> the dress doesn't work great, huh? <laughs> oh, that's so cute. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Okay. That does sound like a dream world, though. Yeah, you're being very nice. Yeah, you're very mean, Echidna. Oh, that's very good to know. Ask lots of good questions. <laughs> She's so mean. <laughs> Repressed and blocked off. Whoa, but aware of it is different. Damn. 
okay, there's a difference between awareness of potential of failure and setting yourself up to fail. That's super interesting. Is that the tree? The tree. I guess not. The what? Looks like it. Oh. Fuzzy faces. Whoa. Oh, never mind. Not fuzzy. And that's her hair thing. <gasps> yeah, why are you gonna be mean about everything, Akito, now? You remember? Who's that? Mm. Okay. So, not your mother. They were too busy? What is that even? Okay, okay, okay. Bye. Just, just left here and locked in from the outside. Yeah, for sure. This is when the snake comes in. Like, where's the snake? Nah. I'm waiting for the fucking snake in the garden. Holy shit. <laughs> Are you the snake? Nope. That's a snake. You want to eat an apple? Oh boy, freedom. I wonder why. The little twisty hair as she dropped was so cute. Okay. Oh shit, those are cultists. <laughs> those are fucking cultists. They're giving them food. Yo, are they the pre- Yo, what? <laughs> Juicy? You wanna go on a date? Oh. Whoa, 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 whoa. The seal. What? 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 Motherfuck, what are we listening to? Those are characters. What am I, what are we watching? What is this? To force? To force? They're isolated because they're dangerous. Hi, Legolas. Legolas. Why is this? Why do I? Why do I know this guy is gonna betray us? I don't believe in you. I don't believe in you. <laughs> Me trusting Juice. 
over over pretty blonde boy. What the fuck is wrong with me? How the fuck can any of this be the way that things are? Okay, so the seal and that are separate. Right? And everybody knows about her. No secrets there. What? 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 Juice. Juice. But if the witches are sin and they worship the way, I don't know. I don't know. We don't know anything. Even if others don't. Okay, so they are disliked. But they're protecting this group. They might. I think they have. Had. Had? My brain is melting, folks. We're not even a tenth of the way through the Beppa Bode booty. She's so hot. I can't. I've noticed. <laughs> I've noticed, Lady Fortuna. Praise the elves. You better hurry back, little princess. Yeah, hey, you jumped down a bunch of things. The spurts. Oh, I thank you, spurts. They have hidden your lies. Hmm. The spirit showed you the way and then helped you lie about it. Oh, spilled paint. Nice. Smart as fuck. But it's not, it's not horrible. It's just a thing that happens. It's not like you snuck out or anything. Not Kazama, though. Damn. It's gonna hurt a lot when this character dies. <laughs> <laughs> about you not being mean to me for one second <laughs> his influence on you indeed arigato so called fairy There's more here. Okay. Maybe the bad stuff. The seal. She sneaks out and breaks a seal? Is that what happens? Fuck. So-called fairy. So-called fairy. Sneaky. Sneaky coont. That's cute. Ah! It's the best. It's the best fucking thing. Wow, yeah, same thing again. He's been sneaking out. Ah! 
can only be a good thing unless... How adult. <laughs> Are they flirting? Let's go, Juice. You got the juice! That's why I keep pressing ya, pressing ya, pressing ya, pressing ya. What? Are you up a fever? <laughs> nope, just hot. Not warm, just hot. Cute. These two, they're so cute. It's gonna bloom into so much pain. Barka! He asks every time. It's like... It's like it's why he's really here. Shit's weird outside. Mom and Dad? Let's go check it out. Oh boy. There is one tree in the forest from which you shall not eat. That's a frozen tree. Whoa, what the fuck is that? Come on, Echidna, you gotta want to know what's behind that fucking door. That's the, where the witch bitch is, right? There's a witch in there. That door goes to elsewhere. This is cool. Suddenly we Narnia. This is cool. Huh. Nothing feels spooky or scary about this at all. I'm sure as a tiny child I should do this. What? Yeah, man, everybody knows. <laughs> oh, eighth grader. <laughs> I don't know what a Lingdorn is, but I bet it has a big dick. <laughs> Oh, we don't know, man. Thank you. We're doing outside stuff at the same time we're doing inside stuff? I don't know. I want to just focus on the inside stuff. Yeah. Yeah, he is a big spooky boy. I I don't know what the answer to that is. Or the answer to this. Tiny Amelia is the cutest fucking thing in the entire world. Yeah. Yeah. 
their fault. Whoa, whoa, whoa. The sky red and the forest white. We want you to go back. We want you to go this way. Uh-oh. What the fuck? Why do we have speed lines now? Halt. Oh. The appointed time. What? Okay. Good. Found. <laughs> Wait, does he recognize? He's not allowed to meet her. Oh, Josama, princess. Her words, he can't see her. What the fuck? Instant tears. He's been working toward her this whole time. What does she represent? She's the hope for the future, man. She's like the daughter of God or something. No, he's like not blinking so that he can take it all in. Whoa. Yeah, to be raised up by his... Whatever this is. I don't know what the fuck this is, man. You're like his everything. Totally. Yeah, we gotta find out more. <laughs> Whoa. It would be weak. To live up to it. To be worthy. All right, bad voice inside her head. Ah! <laughs> She's so cute. Oh, look, going to talk to the seal. You can't confine somebody like that. She just needs to be in a cage so that she'll be safe. Just put that bird in a cage. <laughs> Uh, come on! <laughs> You're too formal. You're too formal, bro. <laughs> Using your own... Ah! So hot.
the what? They take her seriously, though. Why do you want to keep me from it so bad? Oh boy. There it is. Shit. Shit. Uh oh. That's a scary thing to promise. <laughs> I love this dynamic. I love this. This is so great. Yeah, let's follow up on that. Weird little glowy lights. They've been telling me what to do. Oh shit, they just do. They're not malicious. Maybe. Okay, normal spirit wielder shit. Okay. Okay. Not the snake in the garden. Not getting... Well, but maybe... She should be prepared, yeah. It's the same thing with the cage in the house. <laughs> so fucking cute, I can't. Overwhelmed. <laughs> that sound is still gone. Basically a child. What? <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> Truly just like just like father and mom, just like a married couple. So cute. This is so cute, they just need to bang. Clearly they didn't, one of them died, both of them died. No, she died. Fuck. Don't talk about them. Yeah, those things that normal people have. It's a promise. Oh no! Oh no! Fuck. Ah! Never gonna see you again. Never gonna see you again, it's all over now. Why is it so brutal? This is so fucked up. 
Do we have enough time to show us how fucked up this is gonna get? Or are we just not going to? What are we gonna do here? Like, what are we actually gonna do here? Hmm? Huh? Spirits go bye-bye. That is a twitchy noise and the camera moves with. Locked in, taking the power. That's one of the- <gasps> It's Fuckboy McFucked! You're in my fucking space trespassing, bitch. <laughs> no eyes, no eyes. Damn, he's just off his rocker immediately. Authority. Bad news is what he is. Wow. Yeah, bathroom. Oh boy, and what a journey. What a journey it was through the memories. Okay. I want to start where you don't think that I'm going to start. I took notes, quite a, quite a bit of notes, because there was some wild stuff in this episode. My favorite thing about this episode is a visual thing. And that's pretty rare for ReZero. Resource is a, a solidly enough pretty show, but it doesn't, like, knock it out of the park visually for me in a lot of ways most of the time. It has a couple of times recently with some visual language and some metaphor and some storytelling that's been really solid. Eyes, man. But the thing that was in this episode is that fucking character design right there. With the enormous eyes and the pouty little face and the little rounded-ass little chin. And all the, all the hair features are still there that are shrunk it down and made more goopy. That's a top-tier cutie patootie. Right there. Also, a very, a very sexy mother Fortuna. Mommy? Yes. Well, that's such like a minor element. It does hold everything together. The episode feels so cute. And there's so much of it that's so childish and exploratory in a way where we've gone back into those memories and really changed gears. Makes me quite glad that this is where I ended up taking a bit of a break. Like if I'd taken a the break where I, I did before, between like episode 15 and 16, that would suck dick balls. As is, there's a pretty dramatic change of pace between the previous episode and this one. We really spend our time with Amelia here. And I mean with her. We are with her through every step of this journey, not as her child self, but as her now adolescent self observing that child self and coming to understand her learning willing finally unbroken enough supported enough finally to dive back through these past memories and to find things out so far most of what we have found out has been minor and mundane feeling with the exception of things that are so obviously enormous and powerful, the seal, the fairies. But everything else feels like a childhood, a strange one. Why is Amelia so important? Why is she kept protected this way? What was up with her parents? Why are they hidden from her? Why are these memories withheld from her? Why does Echidna humor her? That's one question we get answers to. Because Echidna is curiosity, right? Knowledge. The desire to know. And with that comes the desire to answer questions, too. But Echidna also takes a different role in this episode than she has previously. For Subaru, Echidna's been something else to relate to. For Amelia, there's a different tone that I get. It's like a reflection of self. They stand together and witness. Subaru and Echidna have stood across from each other and have spoken. They speak to each other. But Echidna and Amelia, they witness together. They observe together. And Echidna makes her sly remarks and thoughts. 
and Amelia deals with them. And that's very much like going through with your own conscious mind and witnessing and observing the fragments of yourself. Because we are all multiple personalities. It's weird to say, but we're, we're all multiple aspects. To put it, you have a hungry self, you have a lustful self, you have a, a, a an angry self, right? But you also have like a critical self or a self-critical self who doesn't like you very much. So you go back and you evaluate a memory of that time you asked a girl out in high school and you're like, okay, that was a pretty embarrassing memory. I go through it. I, I did it badly. And your critical self is like, you're a fucking loser. You're the, you're never going to get a girl ever. Ha ha ha, sucker. You're like, okay, all right, you can shut the fuck up. Let's evaluate this more coherently. This has that vibe where Echidna is that like, ha ha, loser, sort of a, a voice in, in Amelia's head. And Amelia now, with the stability and self-confidence, is able to stand up to her. To like take her explanations and representations and descriptions and recognize them for what's valuable in them and parse out the mean and cruel parts. Because that's pretty true. Your analytical, straightforward, critical mind can be quite critical um, and quite harsh, you know, quite mean. You've got to parse those things out. When you ask yourself for answers, you won't always get answers that you like. And maybe that means that you need to accommodate the answers that actually come back. And maybe it needs, means that you need to change the self that's giving the answers so that it gives answers that you like, that you can stomach. If you, like, turn to yourself and, like, and ask, how can I be a better person in the world? And your self's answer is, you can't, bitch. You suck at everything. Maybe you're not the problem asking the question. Maybe the self that comes up with that answer is the thing that needs to be rechanged, right? Like, maybe it's not right. Maybe maybe it's not always correct. Similarly, maybe Echidna, all-knowing though she might be, doesn't know how people work very well and isn't very kind. Like here, Amelia thinks, I'm still not prepared, even after all of this. I failed that trial before and it's still going to be hard and Echidna hits that from the analytical perspective like oh I see what you're doing you're creating this line of defense that's like well I guess it's hard anyway I, I, I might fail you're being pretty defeatist and Amelia takes that and goes yeah yeah I hear you but that's not quite what I'm doing I'm just preparing myself I'm being ready and she looks up right she's dancing with her own negative side that dark voice that's like the 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 voice of the devil inside you is how it's been um <laughs> as how how it's been represented for a long time it's how in high ren the youtube video and song by ren it's how it's represented as the 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 voice of the snake in eden or or and echidna embodies some aspect of that some aspect of like a voice inside your own head that kind of just wants you to fail because it sees you and it, it doesn't really like have skin in the game and you fail you just wants to It'd be cool, right? It'd be like, it's, it's the it's the place from whence intrusive thoughts come. They're like, what if you just stepped off the bridge? It doesn't really want you to. It's not actually interested in, in that. It's just like, what would happen? What would that feel like? That's weird. Shut up. Fuck you. The princess room. And we step on through and into reality. Mother Fortuna. Pretty cool. Your kind features come from your mother, my father's younger sister, aunt. Too busy to spend time with me sounds like something you've been told that isn't true. And then this garden temptation exploration discovery framework out, out, out of the crib, through the cabbage patch into the cornfields and away like oh it hits so many beats it hits so many notes the child who is caged for their own protection needs freedom doesn't see the cage as anything but a cage not as a wall not as a fortress goes out and accidentally unleashes opens pandora's box but something is leading her there. It's more than nothing, isn't it? And there's more than nothing going on here, too. Okay, I have to mention that little E ah are my favorite thing in the episode. The character design is top titty. But, but... I, 
would watch the whole show if it was just that. I don't trust Archie. Sorry. It's a weird thing. It's probably like Reinhard. We do, we do do a lot of body panning over Mother Fortuna. And I mean, all praise, right? Like, all praise. I've just been noticing it because I've been watching Food Wars and there's so much body panning. It's like whenever um, Mikumi comes on stage or on screen, it's always like pan up from titties, pan up from ass, like every single time. So I just, I'm, I'm noticing it a bit. It's very much present here. It's pretty interesting. <laughs> because there isn't usually that much in ReZero. There's like little bits of Savisu, but this is like, that's a pretty Savisu character. Pretty interesting. But far, far, far more interesting. And really probably the reason for the pan. Okay. Yeah, the reason for the pan is to reveal Beetlejuice, right? Yeah, it's Juicy, juicy Boy. It's I'm making a, a mountain out of a molehill. Your brother and his... So what is... Is the seal intact? Nothing has changed. If the worst were to happen, I could never face my brother and sister. You mean your brother and his wife. Not your sister. What? That's weird. It's all right, I know, but I must never forget the weight of the responsibility I carry. You mean your brother and his wife? There's some nuance there that do that is not going to make sense until it makes sense, isn't it? Why are they bringing food to these people? Why have they forced them to live in the forest? It's to protect that seal? Or to protect Amelia? Or to keep them isolated from everyone because there's some danger inherent to their existence. Maybe as a population, maybe because they're elves, maybe it's from whence the race stuff stems. I don't fucking know! I don't know. I can't let her meet you, a sinner such as myself could never, and then he calls them all sin sinners. As long as she grows up healthy, that's enough. His worship of her is significant, for she is probably the vessel, right? That's the idea, isn't it? It's, so, it's fucking something like that. I don't know. Banter is great. Characters are awesome. Amelia sneaking out is amazing. And the, 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 the lies compounding is spooky spooky. Because it's those little lies compounding that makes the actual events that are going to happen feel like they're betrayals. And that is where we're going to move to. We get these interactions between these two that are potent. And so we come here. And a seal surrounded by frozen forest. Clearly, this will be unleashed, and the whole of the cinematography changes. It's really cool. It's really cool. We're very, like, open and simple and small with wide eyes here, but also very third-person omniscient. Here, we become a child. We become so tiny in the face of this enormous thing. It's so, it's so Narnia. The shifting perspectives, it begins to anchor our reality there at that location and then later there's a piece of reality anchoring that's really powerful as well and it's when bad boy regulus shows up he anchors our reality through the camera hitch, hitch, hitch. Come here, come here. so cute but then what are we looking at i don't know about coloring the sky red and the forest white lovey salvation like never before he is witnessing like the rebirth of god this is religious fervor absolute worship and he is embraced by the object of that worship of course he becomes as dedicated as he is but to what questions without answers yet here here it becomes powerful. So many things that I have forgotten. But I will not cower in fear. So you won't depend on a man or a father figure, even though it's so typical of a filthy woman like you. And her answer is that she wants to live up to those things that he wrote. It's finally a change. Because we've been able to see each other so sincerely, it's no longer that Subaru is living with an Amelia that's a fake that's living in his head, that he's talking to a false version of her. It's that he sees her and sees the real her and sees the her that she could be and believes in the her that she could be. 
You are worthy. You are capable. You are perfect. And that's not without recognizing the imperfections and the incapabilities and the lack of worthiness in the person that's there. They're not mutually exclusive. It's not the vision of me, the version of me that lives inside your head, but must be so amazing. It's thank you for helping me become more like the version of me that you see. It's so amazing to be seen by somebody who sees me as things that I can't see myself as. It gives her a place to aim for. That's powerful. So the trial begins. Protection. Didn't we make a promise? And so breaking a promise was very bad. A promise is the embodiment of trust. And so we make two promises here. Because breaking it will betray that trust. It must not be done make three actually first we reaffirm the promise not to go near the seal second promise that you'll keep your promises and the third is that mother fortuna promises that she'll tell her the whole truth we find out just a little bit about being a spirit user and express our love and then he's here this is what I mean by reality anchoring. Here we are stuck. Here's reality. Here's reality. Now reality moves with him. This was a place. Now it's his place. And you're in it. It's his whole attitude. It's all about how dare you. It's about to get ugly. But this episode was pretty darn beautiful. Thank you for bearing with me as I stumbled through it. I don't... I don't know if this was good. I hope it was good. I tried. There's a lot of weird shit in this episode. Fucking Betelgeuse is here. Fucking Fortuna. Why are they bringing them food? Why are they isolated from everybody? What is going on? What is this forest deal? Why is the... What is, what is sealed inside the seal? And how did she let it out? And why is that such a betrayal of this promise? We'll have to find out next time on ReZero. Thanks for watching this episode. I'll see you next time for more. Much love. Peace.